I'm Chandra Thomas Whitfield of Colorado Public Radio, and I want to welcome you to the Solution Studio at Metropolitan State University of Denver. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Joe O'Day, the Republican candidate for U.S. Senate. Welcome, Joe. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate being here with you. So we meet again. We've, we we've talked <laughs> in the past. And I also would like to thank our four MSU Denver student panelists, Gabe Trujillo, Naomi Hawkes, Nayeli Sanchez, and Brian Bartholomew. Thanks for joining us and participating today. Joe, you have five minutes to present your answer to each of the Solution Studio challenges that were shared with you in advance, followed by two rounds of questions from each of our student panelists. So pretty intense. Good. Good. <laughs> the heat is on, it. right? Yes. <laughs> so let's start with challenge number one. The MSU student focus group research reveals a perception that home ownership sits at an unreasonable rung on the ladder of economic security. Dedicated to, even for students dedicated to attaining a four year degree and pursuing a stable career. This is a national issue, not just in Colorado. What will you do in the next six years to lead and engage the federal government to expand access to home ownership and affordable housing options. Well, Jen, great to be here with you. Thank you so much. As some of you may have read about my bio, I'm a contractor. I've built homes, I've built bridges, I've built roads. I continue, our company builds heavy civil work here in Colorado. Um, and affordable housing is key to advancing the economy here in Colorado. I know when my wife and I purchased our first home back uh, 1988, we'd saved uh, quite a bit of money to put a down payment on it. Uh, things were much more affordable at the time, and it was a really good feeling for us to be homeowners, and it's part of the American dream. And I want to make sure as I advance in the Senate here over the next six years that we keep that in mind. That's part of the American dream. One of the things that we've seen here in Colorado that's really um, cost a lot of money and changed the market here in Colorado is something called the construction defect law. It passed back in 2004, 2005. And what that did was extend the warranties on homes uh, for builders. Um, and it didn't create a very viable system for solving problems, but it did cost a lot of money in additional insurance. And it also created a, a uh, uh, an attorney um, I would say a lot of lawsuits that eliminated uh, a product that uh, a lot of people used as their first home. It was called the condominium prod product. Um, it created a, a sustainable house uh, that was affordable uh, with a density that you could own. Uh, currently, what we see in, in Colorado is a lot of apartments that are for rent. And the reason they're for rent is they have a difficult time selling them under this construction defect law. We need to fix that law. <laughs> that's something that's key to reducing the cost and providing a condominium, which is in many times a starter home for people. We've also got problems at the government, at all different levels of the government. We've got problems at the at the uh, local level, the state level, and the federal level with requirements that are being put on home builders and home uh, development. Uh, we've got red tape at a lot of different levels. Anytime you put red tape in place and you hold back ingenuity, you hold back uh, competition, uh, you're creating a barrier that costs a lot of money. Um, we also have requirements for efficiency that they began to put in now for different types of homes. Uh, maybe you can't get a gas burning stove now, or uh, gas burning heat. Maybe you can't have uh, certain electric dryers, maybe you can't have certain gas appliances, that's adding cost to these homes. The other requirement that we've put on in place is we've got a fuel policy here in the United States that's driven the cost of gas and diesel up. Everything that goes into a home is delivered on a truck, and that truck runs on diesel. So the higher those diesel prices are, the more it costs for every one of these products. If you look at concrete, uh, we've got diesel that's gone up $2. Concrete has gone up to keep up with that $40 a cubic yard. Translated, that's about $4,500 to the average home in cost 
that's associated just with the price increase that we're seeing in diesel. So we need a fuel policy that embraces uh, cheaper fuels so that we can continue to drive costs down. Density requirements here in Colorado uh, are, are being put in place that prohibit multiple homes on a lot. Uh, we've seen that through different markets. Give you an example, if I can build a duplex on a lot in Denver and sell that home, it's about 500,000 a piece. If I put a, uh, a single family home on there with all my sunk costs, it's 800,000. So you can see there's a direct correlation to density. The last piece of this is the federal interest rate. Federal rate has been held down uh, artificially for the last five, seven years. We've seen it at 2%, 2.75. What that's done is it's created uh, an ability for people to afford larger and larger priced homes that's driven the cost of homes up. Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, if you had 2.75% interest rate on a home valued at 600,000, you would have the same payment as this new interest rate that we're gonna see now that the Fed has hiked is 6.5%. You could only afford $392,000 home. All of these have added to the cost of affordable housing. We need to get government out of the way. All right, now we take it over to our students for their questions, and we're gonna begin with Brian. Okay. Um, I got a question dealing with housing in the American Disability Act. There's a significant employment rate between deaf and hearing individual in the United States. Um, deaf candidates like myself often proceed as too disabled to work for any industry, and many of the company have uh, spoke about it being uh, having a burden to accommodate for me. Um, this greatly affects my opportunity to be able to own a home as there's no career opportunity and I am about to finish my um, degree and I'm terrified of my future. So what is your solution to strengthen the American Disability Act to allow people with disability to push up on that ladder to have economic security to buy a home. Well, I believe that we need to keep that act in place and we need to enforce that act. I'm an employer. Uh, I've employed um, thousands of Coloradans. I own a construction company and I also own an event center. And I truly believe that there's some value in everyone. We have people at our business that are in wheelchairs. We have people in our business that are disabled or have some kind of but we've found a place for them to fit with us and advance their careers. And I think that's separate from the affordable housing issue. Affordable housing to me means making sure we can keep the price down to where all Americans can afford a home. At the same time, uh, people with disabilities should be entitled to have a career. They should be entitled to buy a home. And, and I believe in that and I'll do everything in my power to make sure we continue down that path. I'm constantly looking for jobs that not only benefit me in having a happy career, but also that pay me enough to afford housing, even just renting out an apartment. And as well with my parents being immigrants, it's become a very heavy burden on them to find enough money to get a down payment on a home. So I am left to fulfill the dream of becoming a homeowner. How will new programs to make housing more affordable and having all these, like you mentioned, bringing down that fuel policy benefit me in the long run when I actually buy a home with the mortgages going up every year. Well, again, I, I'm a big proponent of home ownership. It's the American dream. And we need to make sure that everything we do as a government helps to promote competitiveness, uh, innovation, ingenuity, um, when we impose red tape across the board for a one-size-fits-all, sometimes we have bad things that take place from that one bill, i.e. the Construction Defect Act. Uh, some uh, estimators have said that that's added 30 to 35% of cost to a condominium. 
Well, if a condominium's 350, 400,000 here in Colorado or in Denver, and we can eliminate 30%, we're starting to get that down to a point where everyone can afford the American dream. And so I think we need to have policies that encourage competitiveness, that encourage innovation. We gotta get government out of the way. Naomi. Hey, O'Day, uh, nice to have you here. Um, so <laughs> it's very clear that um, Americans, especially the youth here, we have, um, there's a big lack of financial literacy. I mean, just as you said yourself, you're spitting out these numbers and it's very overwhelming to a lot of the students and people here in America. Um, and they're very naive about the outlook on what it takes to really own a home in any type of economy. So my question is, say you're given, you know, all the resources, um, you know, approval of policies and money, um, what kind of programs and initiatives are you going to start to secure financial literacy, literacy um, in young teens and adults? Um, how would you do it? Well, I think that starts with our education system. And if we're not educating people about the value of money, how to balance a checkbook, how to keep track of your personal finances, we're not doing our kids a good, uh, good service. I think that starts at the high school, junior high level. Uh, I know in, at my home, uh, my parents believe that we should be independent. We should have our own bank account. We should save our own money. We didn't make very much of it, but what we did make, we saved and we managed ourselves. And so uh, I'm a big responsibility, accountability person, uh, especially with kids. And I believe this transcends through all of America. If we empower kids to keep track of their own finances, keep track of how they spend their money, Talk to them about consequences. If you spend on this, you're not gonna have money for that. And I believe that starts with our education system. Uh, and, and we're doing our kids a, a complete disservice if we're not talking to them about how to save money, how to earn money, what you know it's like to pay taxes. I think that those are really important considerations for our kids and making sure that they're prepared to go into the work world, the business world, and have all the tools that they they need to be successful. All right, Gabe. Awesome, thank you very much for your time for being here. Um, and so a question that I have, a lot of the solutions that you provided are very, can seem very long-term. What about for the immediate families who are at need and at risk for becoming unhoused? Um, and there's and there's still very, very low resources available to them and stuff because of the, um, rising rent prices and stuff. So what would you propose for the immediate needs while everything else takes time to settle in? Well, we have an enormous amount of money that's been left over from the um, rescue, uh, the 2000 or $1.9 trillion rescue plan that was put in place. Um, those funds should be available. I know we've got uh, billions of dollars that were devoted to school systems that still haven't been spent yet. There should be more money available through some of those programs, not necessarily school, but they've been awarded to city and county of Denver. They've been awarded to a lot of the municipalities. They're sitting on a lot of those funds right now. If there needs to be a short-term crutch, those funds have already been put out in place and those funds should be used for something that would bring value to our community. I would look to those places for that solution, that short term. But we can't ignore the long term problem. The long term problem is solvable if we can get the bureaucracy of government out of the way. And that needs to start today. We need to be repealing a lot of the rules that are put in place that are driving these costs up considerably. People want something affordable. People want something that they can move into tomorrow. Uh, we've got to get out of the way of business so that business will begin to invest in Colorado. If we wanna drive the price of homes down, we have to flood the market. I'm a big supply guy. If you put a lot of supply out there, it'll lower the price of things. And so I believe that's the long-term solution. All right, on to challenge number two. Americans know our immigration system is in dire need of meaningful reform. How will you get Congress to finally pass comprehensive immigration reform? And what would be the major components of this plan? Well, to start with, um, my wife's family uh, immigrated here in the 40s. Uh, she's a, a Mexican immigrant from, her, her grandparents came over. 
Uh, he was working for the railroad here. And so this issue is very personal to me. At the same time, I have a company that employs 80% Hispanics uh, and has for years. Two of my partners grew up at our company. They were there for 21, 22 years. They started as laborers, went through the trades just as I did. And they uh, have advanced to the place where they're now general and superintendents and they're actually running my company so I can run for office, by the way. And, and they're helping me with that. They're full partners of mine. This immigration system has to get solved. Um, I, I would attack it with about a four point plan. Uh, first off, we've got to secure our border. We can't have people just coming across willy nilly. We can't let the cartels control our border. We can't have human trafficking. We can't have fentanyl coming across here, record paces that's killing good young Americans. Uh, and, and we also need to make sure that um, we know who's crossing the border. It's a humanitarian crisis. We need to recognize that right now and we need to solve it. Uh, we need more border patrol. They're being inundated even at the border crossings. They don't have the proper time to take care and check people in because there's so many people coming across our border right now. We need to complete the wall. That's what the border patrol is asking us to do to make the border more secure. But we need big gates in the wall. I actually believe that we can put a bill together that would solve this issue and we can get 60 signatures in the US Senate. We have to make sure that we recognize that there's DACA kids here through no fault of their own. They need to be citizens. I would make sure that's in the bill. At the same time, we need to streamline our immigration processes. I have guys that have worked for me for 15 years. They've been on several different visas, uh, paid five grand to an attorney to get them through their citizenship and still can't get their citizenship. That's a broken system. When you go to try and get citizenship right now and you're told I'll have a hearing for you in three and a half, four years, that's a broken system. Um, we need to look at the numbers that, are, that we need to come across here legally. We need to review that. Um, for those that are already here illegally, we need to put a process in place. They need to get in line so that they can get their legal status here to go to work. We need a comprehensive plan, but we also need to look at our, our temporary visas. H2B, those temporary visas are grossly, grossly uh, undermanned right now. If you talk to farmers, if you talk to landscapers, if you talk to uh, people in the hotel retail business, they need way more people. There's plenty of jobs available. To me, there's an area where if we bolstered the numbers of H2B so people could come here legally, pay taxes, be part of a great society, now we begin to solve this issue. Michael Bennett ran on this issue back in 2010. He said he would solve it. It is not solved. I'm on a mission. When I hit the US Senate, this is one of my number one priorities and I wanna solve this issue for Colorado, for America. Back to our students, Nayeli. I think as an undocumented student myself, um, having to be left with in a limbo after DACA was put on pause back in 2016 was kind of really bouncing back and forth with this new court decision that was just made last week. And you mentioned a lot of all these jobs being available and not enough employees because of not holding legal status. Um, I think what really drives dreamers to keep doing the work and building the economy in the U.S. is having that legal status and having that being bounced back and forth is kind of worrying and knowing that Judge Hannon might end up saying, I don't agree with the new court laws. How would you put into place this legal path like you were mentioning, not just to citizenship, because maybe that's not what everyone else wants, maybe just holding that legal status to work and fill this these job openings with the knowledge that all these people have? I think it, it starts with a comprehensive program. The reason this has failed so many times in Congress is because we've tried to segregate issues and solve one issue, then we're gonna solve the next issue, then we're gonna solve the next one. We need a comprehensive program that does all of it at one time. That's the only way you can get 60 votes in the US Senate is to put something comprehensive on that we can get some good Democrats to come across the aisle with some good Republicans to solve this issue. 
I'm a master at that. I've been doing that for the last 35 years of my career. I, I, my, our business is here in Denver. I'm a contractor, but I've had to deal with tons and tons of municipalities. And guess what? If you're working in Denver, you get to talk to a few Democrats every once in a while. I've been able, through my experience, to bring teams together of people that want to solve an issue. I'm going to use that skill set to solve this issue. I'm excited about it. It'll be one of the very first bills that I run. Naomi. Thank you for your comments. I greatly appreciate those. Um, I would like to state that America was built off immigration. Um, we, yet we treat immigrants as unworthy of human rights and equal opportunity, and the same treatment is aimed at indigenous people as well, regardless of the fact that they were the original stewards of this land. Now with this next question, I greatly appreciate how you've been answering questions, but I don't want this to be opinionated. I would prefer a step-by-step -step or, as you said, four-point plan option idea, if you could present it in that way. What are you going to do step by step to create equal opportunity and equal human rights to immigrants and indigenous people while convincing your political party to support you? Well, I'll try my best. Um, that's a lot of pressure though. <laughs> I, I think it starts with respect. Uh, that's a key word in my uh, growth as a, as a, a young student. Uh, through, I, I went through a Catholic uh, school as a, as a young kid, and one thing that we learned was the word respect. And if you don't treat others the way you want to be treated, then how can you expect them to respect you? Expect them to respect you, sorry, tongue twister. But I really believe in that thought, and so uh, we have to balance policy with equality. And, and what I mean by that is we need to make sure that we encompass as many people as we can in a policy that does as much as it can for all the people. It shouldn't discriminate against anyone. And so I've been a big proponent of that is making sure we are, are inclusive. At my company, you get graded on your character, you get graded on your work, you get graded on your ability to respect others. And if you're a good person, you advance at my company. I live and die by that. That's the one thing that I think is really important. We shouldn't be judging people about their religious beliefs, about their gender, about any of that stuff. That's all their own opinion. That's not something that as a business, I should be judging people. And I want to advance people that want to work hard. That's the one criteria I have. And so I think if you take that criteria to the US Senate and you look at bills that way to make sure that it's supportive of people, despite anything else, it's going to be good for Colorado. All right, Gabe. Awesome, thank you. So um, you mentioned um, that you want less people coming in here illegally um, and, and more legally and stuff. Um, and so my question is, like, a, a lot of people who are at the border and stuff are trying to um, find ways to come in legally and stuff however those are very very limited or very inaccessible and stuff and have like very hard criteria um to reach in order for for it to work so my question would be what would you propose to fix um the long wait times the criteria and to find more just more um opportunities for people to be able to come into the country well, I, I think there's a limit as to what the United States can accept in immigration in any one given year. I don't know what that number is. I think there's economists out there that can talk about job growth, that can talk about uh, growth of our economy, that can tell us how many immigrants can come into the United States and still maintain some balance. I believe there has to be balance about that issue. Uh, but at the same time, we've got to know who's coming in. We can't have a situation where we have people coming across illegally that we don't know who they are, where they've been, uh, if they're on a terrorist watch list. I think that number's up to 78 right now. Those are people we've actually caught coming across the border. Uh, so there has to be a line, if you will. Uh, I, I don't know how long the line needs to be, but I do know that if we fix the system, and we also have a system here that's ready to receive people in a timely fashion, and we improve on the processes here so they're more predictable, we can shorten that time. And so I've been an advocate, as I said, 
with a comprehensive bill that does all of those things. All right, Brian. Um, as I was listening to uh, some of your solution, um, some of the um, biggest concern of mine is the fact that um, we have um, states there but actually have gone around with the immigration laws and actually have violated uh, human right. And to us, it's like, we don't do that. We already verified who they are and whatnot, and we're just sending them to the, to the right place with the right resources for them. And those states are now sending them to other states to say, hey, we have this problem. And it's not ours anymore, it's yours. And that's our concern because now, I mean, we're Colorado is very purple. We're now kind of in battle ready for those uh, human trafficking from the state that literally violated human right. And what are, how are we going to be able to hold those states accountable at a federal level? versus a state level. I think we missed the point when we start to talk about individual states. This is a national crisis. The border is a national border. And when people come across the border and they inundate towns, uh, El Paso County had 6,000 come into their town in the last month. They've inundated their medical systems. They've inundated their uh, education systems. Uh, they've just overwhelmed them. And I think what you're seeing is some of those border states start to say, we can't do this on our own. We need help. And I think what you're seeing is a cry for help. They're trying to draw focus to this issue so that we can get a government, i.e. Congress, to solve this. That's why I'm running. That's why I'm going. We need somebody that recognizes this is a national issue it's affecting all of the states, especially when you start talking about the drug trafficking that's coming across and what it's done to our kids. 107,000 young adults have passed away this last year from drug overdose. Personal story for me because we have a very close family friend, 25-year-old daughter they lost to fentanyl overdose. We've got to do better at our border. And I believe that these governors are trying to draw attention to this so we can solve it nationally. That's why I'm running. That's why you need to vote for me on November 8th because I'm going to go solve this issue. I kind of want to touch back on how you were talking about just kind of updating immigration laws that are currently in place for people that withhold visas or trying to get a, a visa that are already in the United States just because I feel like for my part, at least, if my sister would have sponsored me, I would have had to leave the U.S. and have a wait time about 20 years. So that's pretty much the all the time that I've lived in the U.S. So I really want to ask, how would you independently try to make those updates to the outdated immigration system that we have going back so many years? Well, uh, we got to start over. <laughs> I mean a policy that's gonna force you to go home for 20 years so you can come back here doesn't make any sense to me at all. Um, and so that's how I come at this. Uh, we've gotta look at the policies that are in place right now, figure out which ones we need to toss out that just are not working, and then get down to brass tacks and say, okay, how can we make an immigration system function that's fair, that's predictable, that's short term, so we don't have to have people waiting 15, 20 years. That's not acceptable. And it's predictable. That way people that come here to the United States know this is the system. I need to sign up for it. It's equitable. I can get treated fairly, and I can get into the United States and be a producing uh, citizen that pays taxes and has a, a great life and has that American dream that my wife and I have had in front of us that all immigrants should have. And so you, we've got to, there's a whole lot of work to do. 
Awesome. So uh, I really appreciate how you did that kind of in a uh, bullet point form for me. I really um, like that answer that you gave me. Uh, my follow-up question I think is going to be more around like you mentioned respect and how I think that I greatly, greatly agree with you that is a matter of rec respect and recognition. Um, when it comes down to specifically indigenous being treated as immigrants on their own land, what treaties are you going to fight to have honored and I guess collaborated with um, and tribes to honor those um, treaties to show that respect so that way you can show that we are not or prove to I guess the people that you believe we are not immigrants um, because those treaties, treaties have never been honored and that's also why we feel like immigrants here on this land as well and I feel like that has a lot to do with immigration reform too. Well, uh, we need to treat all people with, res with respect and, and indigenous people, the American Indians, the people that were here for years and years um, through, you know, that's this is their home. And we should be respectful of that. If there's a treaty in place and it's not being honored, then I'd like to know about that. I'd like to be able to dig into that and find out why is it that we're not honoring that treaty and be able to sit down with people that know a lot more about it than I do to really... Uh, walk through the details of that. There's some specific ones I know a little bit about, water storage, water usage down with the Ute Indians in, in Durango and, and down in those areas that haven't been honored. We've got to do better. Um, I know we have a water shortage, but it shouldn't come out of uh, one person's water rights and not another's. There needs to be balance to those issues. Um, I'll sit down with anybody. I'll discover exactly what it is that they need to have taken care of and then we'll see what we can do to move that issue forward. So cool. So for my follow-up and stuff, um, it's it's more based on uh, Nayeli's question and stuff about DACA. Um, as we know, there is DACA. Um, however, there are still thousands of other immigrant youth like myself who don't have DACA and stuff or whose applications are still in limbo. What would you suggest... Um, for these youth whose future is on the line and who are maybe coming out of college, you know, who are graduating college um, since they cannot work. So what would you suggest for them or what would you propose for them to do um, in this in this time of uncertainty? Well, again, I'll go back to my answer that I gave earlier. This We need comprehensive reform. As you guys have pointed out, there's all kinds of issues, starting with a border that's not safe, and then you go through DACA, then you go through people that are here undocumented that aren't part of DACA, and then you go through a system that doesn't allow people to come here and be predictable on how they get here. This, this whole system needs to be revamped. And, and I'd be an advocate for sitting down with a bipartisan committee at the U.S. Senate where we say, okay, let's fundamentally fix this. Let's fix it now. I think what you're seeing is the national recognition that's taken place over the last year and a half, uh, complete with people moving people around the country to make this you know, a focal point, is starting to attract the attention of the American, uh, American voter, and the American voter wants to solve this issue. I wanna help them solve that issue. And so I would be an advocate for sitting down and making sure that we have a comprehensive program that solves all of it. That's how you get good balanced bills that get through the U.S. Senate. You gotta remember, you gotta have 60 votes. So if, uh, all or none never ends up working too well. So I'll be an advocate for that. I have oh, I'm sorry, you had it, okay. <laughs> um, I would like to pass my um, follow-ups to uh, my co-panelists. So you actually <coughs> brought up a great point of making your vote count um, for us since Personally, I am not able to vote as I'm not a U.S. citizen, but would you be able to write or be up for writing a letter to hold a vote with Congress once you go into office, since you wouldn't go into office till January? Since DACA is at a limbo with Judge Hannon, would you be able to hold the vote with Congress on trying to make a review together and not have such a judgmented, clouded um, decision being brought to the table? Well, I guarantee when I get to Congress, we're going to make this an issue and we're going to take it up with the entire Congress. More follow-up? All right. 
Well, on to challenge number three. What do you see as America's role in global affairs today? And how will you work to maintain America's global leadership over the next six years? Well, I, I really believe in uh, Ronald Reagan's statement about peace through strength. Peace through strength to me means that we have a strong military. We need to acknowledge that when the United States is strong, um, the world is safer. Uh, we can see what's going on right now. We've had, uh, we abandoned uh, our troops in Afghanistan. We abandoned people in Afghanistan. That was a monumental fail. Um, and what that's done is that's created uh, an emboldened uh, Putin who then attacked uh, Ukraine, Russia and Ukraine. These are all because we have not been strong. We don't have strong leadership. Um, we need a strong military. Um, right now, if you look at what's going on with the budget, they continue to take our budget down for the military. It's at record lows right now. We can't do that, not in a time of turbulence. We need to make sure that our military is strong. It keeps the other rogue nations in check. But I, I, the, one of the bigger issues for, being, for having a strong America is a strong economy. Um, we need to get government out of the way, as I've said earlier. Red tape doesn't help grow business. We need to strengthen our economy. Uh, when we have a strong economy and we're trading with people across the world, they don't attack people that they're trading with, right? They, they honor those economies. They want to participate in that economy. Um, energy dominance is the, th is the fourth kind of... Uh, uh, fourth uh, bench or fourth leg on the stool, thank you. Um, but we need wind, solar, we need good clean natural gas, we need geothermal, we need nuclear. We need to raise all energy levels in the United States so that we can provide energy across this nation or across this world. We should be exporting good clean natural gas into Asia right now uh, That with India and, and uh, China. We can uh, lower worldwide emissions by up, some scientists are saying by up to 45% by using good, clean, natural gas. We also need to export to Europe. Right now, Europe is being held hostage by Russia and their fuel. If we were to replace that in the, in the UK, then we would immediately end this Russian war. All of these issues have to do with energy dominance and having America be the superpower economically that it, it needs to be. Let's turn to Nayeli for questions. Protests in Iran by women trying to take some part of control in their own lives. And um, with America's recent decision on Roe versus Wade being overturned, what would your stand be in growing a woman's voice all throughout global affairs while we stay up in that global leadership that you just talked about gaining back? Um, well, first off, uh, as to Iran, uh, my heart goes out. That's uh, sad. Um, but I, I think they've made a, a global mistake. Uh, they don't realize the power of women. And these women are rising up and they are taking this issue on. Uh, I, you never hope for um, violence, but at the same time, what, I, what I've seen out of the Iranian women over there is, is monumental. It's incredible. We need to stand behind Iranian women so that they have their full rights. Um, that's a tragedy what's gone on over there. Um, Roe v. Wade, uh, I've taken a, a I'm personally uh, pro-life, but I don't believe that government should be involved in every decision. I believe that a woman's right uh, for the first five months belongs between her and her doctor. After that, with exceptions, uh, rape, incest, life of the mother, medical necessity, that decision also belongs between a woman and her doctor. I believe women are, are equal. Um, we have a lot of women in our company. Uh, they get paid uh, same or more. Um, I've got uh, my Mile High Station business has been in business for uh, 22 years. It's run by five women. They're wonderful. They're way smarter than me. I stay out of their way. Um, and, I, and I believe we need to get behind people. Again, it goes back to the respect issue. It doesn't matter gender. It doesn't matter race. It, none of that stuff matters. It's about character. It's about empowering people. And that's how I look at things. James. Awesome. Uh, I just want 
make sure you didn't have any follow-up questions for that. Thank you. Time for me. Awesome. Cool. So for me, um, you said, you know, that that you think that we should definitely stand behind the um, Iranian women who are whose rights are being stripped away. How would that look like? How, how, how would that look like from like a U.S. standpoint? What should like the U.S. should the should the U.S. do something and stuff? And if so, how would it look like? Well, you know, we've already got sanctions in place uh, because that uh, government is rogue. Uh, they can't be trusted. Uh, they want a nuclear device. We can never let them have a nuclear device. Uh, but I think it, it's, it's about making sure that we uh, advocate for women there, that we uh, empower them by getting their message out. That's part of, of how this group controls people is they stifle people, they don't let them communicate. And so if we're putting that message out to the world and we get behind uh, the women that are being persecuted, then we can elevate their status. We can make sure everyone knows about it. And I think that's key. Any follow-ups? All right. We now go on to Brian. Um, as we um, aim for equality for all genders on the global scale, we also have worry about our innovation here in the United States with the economic standpoint. And I have noticed that we just passed the CHIP and Science Act that allows us to improve our science and our uh, smart chip. Is there any way of that, that we take that inspiration of that program or that act to greatly improve our um, innovation here in the United States on other fields, such as um, um, agricultural or um, construction, housing, and such? Uh, good question. I. I I, I like the fact that the people are thinking about bringing the chips manufacturing back here to the United States. I think that's an important strategic uh, uh, move. We need to make sure that we can control our own destiny when it comes to chips and, the, and those type of things. My caution with that is that we haven't done all we need to do. Uh, one of the things that I will be an advocate for when I hit the U.S. Senate is permit reform. Right now, if you want to mine those minerals, uh, that we're going to need to actually build those manufacturing plants here in the United States, you can't get a permit. Uh, I've been an advocate for permit reform since I started my business almost 35 years ago. I know a lot about permitting. I know why we're holding things up, uh, but we've got to we've got to make sure that when we make a manufacturing move like that, we also make sure we bring along the minerals that it takes to actually make those things. I've seen it with water storage here in Colorado. I've worked on a couple of projects, uh, Chatfield Reservoir, where we raised the, the level of the dam by 12 feet. Um, and an existing dam, that permit took 27 years to get through the process. We've got wind uh, facilities in uh, northern Wyoming right now that are on their 12th year going through a uh, permitting process with NEPA because we're in the way. Government red tape is holding our economy back. And so that's how I would look at it. Those are the things that I would look at when I get to the U.S. Senate would be permit reform to help with those innovations, to help with that intelligence. Any follow-ups? Go on to Naomi. Uh, so I kind of go off topic from here. I greatly appreciate that. Um, so I think it's just safe to say as an indigenous person that indigenous people worldwide um, are not only traumatized from the attempted genocide on us, but also the fact that we are the most underrepresented and unrecognized minority group worldwide. So with that, um, I would like to ask what programs, um, when even when it comes to like, you know, being coming more aware of treaties and such, um, developing panelists of indigenous people to consult you on specific issues, honoring those treaties, um, will you implement to set tone for other countries in the world with our overdue reparations and recognition? And how will you start to, how will you start the process on beginning those reparations and recognition? Well, I, I'm an advocate for participation. Um, if you want to know what someone's thinking, Get them on your team, bring them in, put them on your team so you can hear their good ideas, 
Um, I've talked about my staff as we move forward. Uh, we have a certain indigenous population here in Colorado. I'd like to have somebody on my staff that would help me make sure that I understand their issues as well. I'd probably put a Democrat on there as well, um, just so that I could hear the other side of things. I think putting people around you that are in tune with what's going on in Colorado is really part of how you involve the entire state. Make sure we got somebody on there that knows a whole lot about agriculture. Make sure we know some has somebody on there that knows about military needs. Colorado Springs is a huge military place. So I would I would use my staff and the people that I that work with me to make sure that I was getting good information so I knew what those issues were so we could address them as we move our country forward. Any follow ups? but it's actually in response to um, Brian's question. So I like how you were talking about, you know a lot about like permits and such like that um, when it comes to like mining minerals and things of that sort. Um, I wanna know what you're going to do in order to make those permits more driven towards indigenous rights and contributions being given to those tribes where we specifically take those minerals from them, such as the Pine Ridge Reservation, which might I add is the poorest county in the entire United States because we took away um, their gold and did not give them any kind of money for that. And also the Diné Reservation, you guys may know that is the Navajo and that is the incorrect term, but is Diné. And they also did not get anything from the uranium mines that destroyed their land. So what are you going to do specifically to advocate for when you go to mine those areas, what kind of you know reparations or contributions are you gonna to give to those tribes that are gonna be continuous rather than just a quick fix? Um, great question, by the way. So I, I think we have to kind of go into this eyes wide open, right? Uh, it means that when we're going to um, build a mine, extract minerals, whatever we're going to do, there's, there's certain ownership rights that go with those, those lands. And some of those ownership rights are from indigenous people. And they need to be at the table having the discussion to make sure that whatever we're going to do is going to leave them better off than they were today. And so I, I think you sit down and you say, here's what we'd like to do. How do you see it? What are your ideas? Um, the one thing that I think the mining industry gets a little bit of a black eye from it is that fact that we don't talk about how we leave things when we're all done. I'll give you an, uh, uh, um, you know, you, you've seen strip mines that are just horrible. People have seen pictures of that. That's not a good solution at all. I've also seen gravel mines that are now one of the most pristine areas in, in all of Denver uh, that people are riding their bikes around. There's a lake left there. It's part of our water storage system. Uh, that's because somebody was thoughtful when they extracted the minerals out of there and they had a plan to restore that to an area that people could be proud of. I'll give you a location is down there at Mineral and Santa Fe. All those were gravel pits through there. It's a gorgeous area. If you ever wanna go fishing, that's pretty good fishing in there. But those are the type of issues that we need to address before we start the mine. And so we need equal, equal representation there from locals, all locals, to make sure that they have a voice in that as well. Jill O'Day, oh sorry, oh, oh, you were looking at me. Jill O'Day, thanks so much for joining us. Can I ask one question? Sure. I'd like, what's your degree in and what you're gonna do when you get out? Yeah, awesome, um, I am a psych major um, and my plan is to go hopefully right into um, a doctorate program in clinical health psychology or higher administration um, and I just really want to increase the opportunities that um, people with oppressed identities have. Great. Yeah. Um, I'm a biology major with a minor in geographic information systems. I plan on doing um, land sustainability, land rehabilitation within reservations, making sure I'm doing a lot of like uh, social activism work as well with my indigenous um, people and just tribes worldwide fighting for their rights of, for land and sustainability and rehabilitation. Thank you. I'm a business management major, and I'm hoping to go into higher education to continue my work with immigrant students. Great. Um, I'm a camp major, focus on um, education, and um, my predominant goal is to try to standardize um, chemical language for deaf students. Okay. Fantastic. 
Well, it's a privilege to meet all you guys today. Thank you so much for having me today. It's nice to be with you as well. Thanks, Joe, and thanks to our student panelists. The Solution Studio is pro it's a project of the Institute for Public Service at MSU Denver in partnership with Colorado Latino Leadership Advocacy and Research Organization, the Colorado League of Women Voters, and New Voice Strategies. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.